So hi, I am Alicia Gonzalez. I am the um, lead for our technical assistance training planning now for California Bridge. And I'm also one of the regional directors and an emergency doctor out here in uh, central coast of California. Um, Eric, I know you already introduced yourself, but do you have anything else about you that you want to say? So, okay. Those are all the things. <laughs> okay, there. perfect. Perfect. And um, as you all know, California Bridge is part of the um, Public Health Institute, and we're really excited to be able to bring you this lecture today as a part of our ongoing training series. And neither Eric nor I have any disclosures uh, to offer. We get nothing but joy from bringing you all this education. So, um, as with most of what we talk about here at California Bridge Program, when usually when we talk about MAT, we're talking about opioid use disorder, but lately we've been doing a lot more talking about stimulants and alcohol and the other things that our patients use. It's really important to put our mindset all in the same place and remember that the reason we do all this work, one of the biggest reasons is that addiction is not a moral feeling. This is us trying to accept that addiction is a chronic medical disease like diabetes or high blood pressure. And yes, sometimes it's a consequence of poor choices that people made, but that's true of a lot of medical diseases that we deal with. And so we have awesome medicines and a great culture of, of supporting people and prolonging the quality and the length of people's lives for all those other diseases and addiction should not be different. Um, and so when we look at our California bridge model, this is a slide that you've seen probably at this point, if you're not new to bridge 400 times. Um, and it's just a reminder of what we're trying to do here. We wanna make access to any kind of treatment for substance use, very low barrier. Meet the patient where they're at the minute that they're ready. We wanna ensure that we have that warm handoff, holler to all of our substance use navigators out there, that warm handoff to ongoing care when they leave that acute care setting. And then finally, developing a culture of harm reduction and of support for this community. And so when we talk about MAT, we often have been talking about opioids. That was like how we got started with California Bridge. And don't get me wrong, opioids are dangerous and they definitely kill people. And it's a, it's a huge epidemic in our country. But there was this really cool paper from um, a UK advisory council that was done in 2009. And they looked at a bunch of different factors that they considered harm. And so this includes issues with your relationships, um, violence at home, um, long-term health effects, economic damages, like all kinds of things that can be harmful as a consequence of substance use. And when they look at that and they break it down, you can see on this graph, alcohol causes more harm to people than any other substance. And this was compared against um, opioids like heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, even tobacco and alcohol far and away was shown to be the most harmful. And when we look at what harm is, we also know that it does translate to death. And when we look at deaths associated with alcohol use, you can see the red and um, is the higher, orange and yellow are kind of middle, you know, blue towards purple is lower rates of use, but it's pretty all over the place, both in urban and in rural communities. But there is definitely um, spots where we see it more concentrated. And so you'll look at this little hub, this is my testing my California geography here, but in New Mexico, Arizona and Utah, we've got a big heavy red spot over here in the Dakotas. And then very noticeably, Alaska is extremely highly affected by, by deaths from alcohol. Eric, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so when we talk about alcohol, there are really significant and important uh, disparities in mortality for race and ethnicity and gender. This paper was from about a year ago, and really the, these authors looked at death certificates and, and really tried to figure out sort of like how, what was the contribution of alcohol to, to mortality, and they found some really striking mortalities. Uh, and really, they also noticed that this was increasing across all demographic groups. So there was really huge disparities in mortality in the American Indian, Alaska Native communities, and then in non-Latinx white women as well. And then really across all groups, like this was just getting worse and worse and worse. And not only that, like we see with a lot of things is, is that like, not only is everything getting worse, but the disparities are getting worse as well. The other thing to note is that this is a disease that affects a lot of really, a lot of younger people. Um, and so that because of that, you know, these are folks in, in the prime of their life a lot of times. And, and that means that it was really impactful for families as well when people, people have severe alcohol use disorder. So this is a paper from the Indian Health Service releases this huge book um, every few years. This one's called Trends in Indian Health 2014. 
Um, and they, just to dig into this disparity here, so there was a 520% higher likelihood of death related to alcohol among the American Indian Alaska Native communities um, compared to everybody else. So uh, this is important to note that within this population, alcohol use disorder, alcohol uh, misuse needs to be considered within the context of historical trauma and exposure to a lot of other risk factors. So there's a lot of stigma here and a lot to unpack, but this disparity deserves our attention and is certainly real and significant. Um, so, you know, while there is this disparity and this stigma, Alaska, uh, American Indian Alaska Native communities do have really high rates, some of the highest rates of complete alcohol abstinence, um, despite a lot of this stigma. These papers also focus a lot on indigenous patients who live on reservations, which is really only a fraction of the population. There's a lot of diversity between tribes as well, um, but really something important to be thinking about and considering when we talk about alcohol use disorder. And in case anybody missed it, this brings us to the remarkable year that was 2020. And I think we all sort of felt in our bones that there was an increase in alcohol use associated with that year. And it turns out that this study in JAMA, um, it did show us that this is true. Almost everyone um, among US adults was drinking more um, during the pandemic. And that's, I think, multifactorial, not just a coping mechanism, but we're spending a lot of time at home. People are cooking at home, they're stuck at home, you can't go out. Um, and so we did see that. Um, unfortunately, that's not a benign thing. You know, when the overall population does increase their substance use of any kind, and in this case, alcohol, that does mean that the harms and consequences from alcohol during this time period um, went up as well. And so we, as much as we appreciate that this can be done in moderation, we know that with that heavy of an increase nationally, that's a trend that's not going quite in the right direction for us. And when we think about the importance of treating people um, for substance use disorder, it's alarming to realize that only one in 10 patients, 10% 10 of patients with alcohol use disorder are in some kind of treatment. And of those people, only half of them are on medications. So only 5% of people with alcohol use disorder. When we think about all the work we've done to make buprenorphine, for example, super accessible to someone with opioid use disorder, it's alarming to realize that alcohol is so prevalent, so, so much more common, and we really haven't made a lot of strides doing that. And so for the remainder of this lecture, we want to talk about how do we make that low barrier treatment for alcohol use disorder, that medication for addiction treatment accessible and something that our patients can get a hold of too. So I want to start by hovering on this slide, and if you need a second, feel free to scan that QR code. It'll take you straight to the California Bridge. Um, it's about two pages plus some references. Quick reference guide for treating an um, alcohol use disorder. We're going to deep dive into a lot of this right now, but this is a good hub for you. I'll hover for like three more seconds, and if you didn't scan it, don't worry. It's still on our website. You can always access it, but step one says to treat alcohol withdrawal. So I need to pause here for a second and mention, not all withdrawals are created equal. This is something that I think confuses people who aren't necessarily, I'll say straight up doctors because all this treatment is new to us clinically. And I'll hear somebody say something about treating withdrawal and they think it's all buprenorphine. So not all withdrawals are created equal. We're talking about different receptors in the body, different effects on the body. The opioid receptor, the mu receptor, that's the withdrawal when we treat with buprenorphine. <clears throat> with alcohol, totally different ballgame. And in alcohol withdrawal, people can die. So opioid use disorder is terrible. It's painful. It's not a fun thing to go through. And, we and it drives a lot of people back to use. So we care very much about that. But it doesn't really kill people. Alcohol withdrawal can actually kill people. It is a life threatening emergency. And so hence why we have to stop and focus on treating the withdrawal first. Um, for any clinicians on the call, this will hopefully not be news to you, but for those who are newer to this, this is kind of the gist of how it goes when you withdraw from alcohol. A little bit more specific to each person, it might shift by a couple hours, a couple days, depending on their tolerance, et cetera. But usually in the first handful of hours, maybe the first day of not drinking, they can get anxious and kind of like that, not being able to sleep, restlessness, some nausea, some belly pain, sounds a little bit like opioid withdrawal. And you're right, it looks kind of similar actually really early on. But as the time goes on, they start to develop like more neurologic symptoms. They get tremors, they start sweating, their tongue starts to do this thing called fasciculating, which is like flipping around. And ultimately um, after several days, they start to get bad vital signs. Their blood pressure gets really high. They can get extremely agitated. They can start having hallucinations and they can have seizures. 
And those seizures, if they're not caught and treated, can cause them to die. Um, and then the other piece of this is that they can get these horrible amnesia style psychotic sort of symptoms um, that are not always reversible if we don't get to them in time. So really, really imperative that we treat alcohol withdrawal, something that doctors I think in the ER are much more familiar with because it is a life-threatening emergency. The two big categories of how we treat withdrawal are two categories of medication. One of them is called benzodiazepines and one is barbiturates. So in the benzo category, um, this is medicines most of you probably have heard the names of. So midazolam, the most common brand name is Versed. Lorazepam, the most common brand name is Ativan. And then chlorodazepoxide, the most common brand name is Librium. So for said Ativan, Librium, again, no disclosures, or we don't have, you know, brand loyalty. It's just what we're used to hearing. And probably those are the words that you hear, kind of like when our patients say Suboxone instead of Buprenorphine, it, it's all the same thing. Um, those medications are shorter acting. You're talking about several hours, maybe the rest of the day. They kick in um, within a few minutes, um, and they're really good for acute treatment. Barbiturates, like phenobarbital is the most common one. That's a medication that also kicks in pretty quick, but it lasts a lot longer. This medication, I think people are less familiar with. So on the, on the benzo side of things, usually you start with two milligrams and then you double it with each subsequent dosing. So you'll go to four milligrams to eight milligrams. Yes, at some point when people are sick enough, they end up getting so many benzodiazepines, they have to get intubated with a breathing tube and put on a machine to support them getting that much medication. With the barbiturates, you, usually you would start with um, either 260 or, or 160, and you can do repeat doses every 15 or 30 minutes. This medication lasts a lot longer. So while they both turn on pretty quick, barbiturates like phenobarb are wonderful for patients that are going to be inpatient. They're going to stay in the hospital for any reason. Like let's say you have you know, appendicitis and you also have alcohol use disorder and you're gonna be in the hospital for three days and you also started withdrawing. Well, what's nice about the barbiturates is that if you if you treat that withdrawal with barbiturates, they're not gonna re-enter the withdrawal weather in the hospital. Whereas if you're using the benzodiazepines, the Ativan, the lorazepam, um, then they're gonna have to get repeat dose the whole time that they're here. So neither is better or worse, but they might be better for certain um, scenarios. And then with the barbiturates also, if somebody's looking to go into treatment, what can be nice about using them is that, again, that they're longer acting. They don't have to go home on a pill form of medication that they're going to taper down to get all the way through the withdrawal period. So just things to think about. Other best practices once you've treated that withdrawal, patients who uh, have alcohol use disorder tend to be really malnourished. And so they need vitamins. Specifically, we put them on a daily vitamin and then like a thiamine and a folic acid supplement. Those are the ones we really care about. Um, we do a lot of counseling about diet and eating in general, because again, they, they tend to get a lot of their calories from alcohol. And so we have to ease them back into eating a balanced diet, getting really hydrated. So remember that alcohol is a diuretic. A lot of these patients are going to be dehydrated. They end up getting fluids <clears throat> when they're in the hospital, but they got to promote that hydration when they leave. And if they're in your care still in the hospital, um, they need frequent reevaluations. This is a patient that you're going to be checking on every 30 minutes to an hour. It's not somebody that we just, you know, go back four hours and see how it went after that one dose of medication. Um, and then thinking about starting the medication early, teaching the patient to know what withdrawal looks like. And so once we've treated that withdrawal and the patient's not shaky anymore and they feel better and they're calmer, now it's time to talk about medication for addiction treatment for alcohol use disorder. All right. Love talking about alcohol withdrawal. So fascinating. Such a, uh, so much to unpack there. It's great. Uh, but, you know, I think that part of this talk, like part of what we're trying to do here is bridge this gap. Uh, you know, I hesitated to use the bridge analogy because this is CA bridge, but between alcohol withdrawal and alcohol use disorder, right? Um, and so we want to think about we, this is like so common in the ED, we're treating patients with alcohol withdrawal, we treat patients with alcohol intoxication, they're coming in um, and we treat the withdrawal, but we also cannot forget to treat alcohol use disorder, right? So this is what we're talking about. So there's a, there's a bunch of medications that can be used to treat alcohol use disorder. There's three that have FDA approval. So there's two forms of naltrexone, PO and XR, and then disulfiram in a campersate. There's some, a bunch of off-label ones, right? Like if you were to just like Google alcohol use disorder medications, there's a ton that'll pop up. Here are some common ones that we'll use either in the ED and clinic fairly frequently, gabapentin, topiramate, carbamazepine. Um, of these options, we're gonna highlight two that I think are have a lot of utility for the ED and might be pretty well suited 
to our clinical situations. And those are gonna be naltrexone and gabapentin. So we'll talk about naltrexone first. So why do we like naltrexone for AUD? It, you know, I think it's, uh, most folks will consider this to be one of the first line treatments for naltrexone. It's FDA approved. Um, but why is this particularly useful in the ED? It's an anti-craving, it's a relapse preventive medication. Basically what it does is as an opioid antagonist, it will interrupt a dopaminergic reward pathway. So it's to reduce cravings for alcohol use. So why the ED? So this is available as a once daily dosing option and you can also do it once a month. So a lot of folks maybe have already had some experience starting PO naltrexone, but you know, there is this XR option as well. So let's go on to the next slide and we'll talk about why I like these medications. Um, so naltrexone is effective, right? There's a, a lot of evidence to support the fact that naltrexone reduces alcohol use and prevents return to heavy drinking. So there's a bunch of studies, but the number needed to treat is around 12 for preventing patients from returning to heavy drinking and reduce these heavy drinking days. Um, the other thing that's important, I think, with naltrexone is that it, it has been shown to be effective in an office-based setting. So where do most of our patients go? They're not all going to addiction specialists right away. They're not all going to specialty treatment centers. A lot of patients with AUD are going to follow up with their primary care doctor. Um, and naltrexone has been shown to be effective in a primary care setting with some like brief, um, low intensity office-based counseling. The other thing is that this, I kind of alluded to this before, but the once daily dosing versus a monthly injection, both of those are great for ED patients, right? Um, you know, acamprosate, two pills, three times a day. Um, disulfram, like lots of barriers to taking disulfram. You have to taper up topiramate, gaba, you know, carbamazepine is multiple times a day. So naltrexone, like once a day in the morning, take your medication. So that's another reason why we like it. We'll talk a little bit later about the XR naltrexone, this monthly injection, but wow, that would be great to do in the ED, right? So we've, we've done that and have some experience with it. And it's a really nice option for patients. And we'll dig into those details shortly. Um, I think this is a really promising opportunity for ED patients. So when shouldn't you use naltrexone? The biggest thing is opioid use. So like get an excellent history, right? Like go ahead and dig in and be like, are you using opioids? Are you sure you're not using opioids? Are you positive you're not using them, <laughs> right? So this is not what you want to have happen. This, will, this is, you know, this is oral naloxone basically. It's a straight up opioid antagonist. So you're gonna have really remarkable opioid withdrawal, precipitated withdrawal if you take naltrexone and have a you know, physical dependency on opioid. The other, the other times not to use this or if you have a really significant transaminitis or decompensated cirrhosis, uh, just to avoid naltrexone in those settings as well. So gabapentin, let's talk about gabapentin. So we've talked about withdrawal, we've talked about alcohol use disorder. Wouldn't it be great if there was a medication that treated both alcohol withdrawal and alcohol use disorder? So gabapentin has been shown to be effective in both of these scenarios. The other thing, right, is like we're fairly familiar in the ED with using gabapentin as a medication. And so that's another reason why I think this is particularly useful. We don't have to get used to like saying carbamazepine over and over again. So when we talk in front of like 100 people, we don't sound silly, right? So um, gabapentin is familiar to us. Again, just connecting these dots. Alcohol withdrawal treatment is around 600 to 900 milligrams PO three times a day. And the studies looking at treatment for alcohol use disorder are about 600 milligrams PO three times a day. So we're encouraging our clinicians in the ED, this is certainly my practice clinically, to treat ambulatory withdrawal with PO gabapentin three times a day to reduce cravings, reduce anxiety, improve sleep. And then when I see them in clinic, I just continue it on. Um, and most of these studies are about 12 weeks. So we just go ahead and continue that in clinic, assuming that it's working. Um, before we go on, there's actually, I've been monitoring the questions and most of them we're going to get to, but this one's a good one. Katie Bell brought up that in the primary care setting, they've noticed that some patients don't tolerate the 50 milligram dose of um, naltrexone very well, but if they start at 12.5 or 25 and titrate, patients seem to do okay with that. Do you have any thoughts about that, Eric? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, I, we start most patients on 50 milligrams daily from the ED. Those are the patients that I'm starting in clinic. That's the dose I'll start at as well. You know, it is totally true that with any of these medications, some patients won't tolerate that bigger dose right away. So I think it's good to use your judgment if a patient is somewhat hesitant or, you know, they're, a, you know, they're just smaller or they have had some sensitivity medications in the past, it's totally reasonable to titrate up the, the naltrexone. 
That said, most of the studies start at 50 right away. So I think it's reasonable to do that as well. Uh, okay, gabapentin. So uh, I kind of talked about this already. So gabapentin has been compared head to head a few times. There's some retrospective cohort studies, you know, like if we want to dig into treatments for withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal, generally the evidence base is not robust. Um, but patients, when they have compared lorazepam to gabapentin, gabapentin does result in fewer cravings in that post-acute withdrawal period compared to the benzos. There's also like sleep was a little bit better. Um, and there was less return to heavy drinking in those patients too. So this might seem a little odd, like to say like, go ahead and use gabapentin instead of a benzo. Um, but it is supported by the American Society of Addiction Medicine as monotherapy for patients with mild to moderate withdrawal. So this isn't something we're using patients like that are headed towards the ICU or even headed into the hospital. These are patients with very low CWAS scores that don't have a history of severe withdrawal that you think that they're going to do well. We want to help them reduce their drinking or stop drinking. And you can use this as monotherapy. You know, like, again, not tons of studies, but in the studies that were, uh, that were done, these RCTs, the number needed to treat is around five or six for reducing heavy drinking days um, for alcohol use disorder as well. So this is a, a, a nice promising medication that we're familiar with that I think we should start to be using a little more often from the ED. And I do want to point out that a number needed to treat a five or six is so low. Like a lot of things we do that we consider gospel in medicine, the number needed to treat is like 50 people. So this is actually like, it's still kind of early for us, I think maybe studying this in the long term, but it's pretty safe and the evidence is there. It's also a good option for people if you use barbiturates. So if you use phenobarbital and you're not so worried about them, maybe re-entering the withdrawal gabapentin is awesome to help with the cravings and those symptoms too. That's a, a really nice combination. So when should you not use withdrawal? When should you not use gabapentin? Um, you know, this is not for patients with severe withdrawal or patients that have like recurrent um, withdrawal seizures. So this is not the patients in that high risk category. This is a low moderate risk category um, for patients with ambu ambulatory, right, going home um, uh, with gabapentin. The other setting is renal failure. So gabapentin, is, as I think a lot of us know, should be renally dosed if you do have increased GFR as well. So something you can talk to your pharmacist about like specific dosing um, changes. Uh, to, as an aside, the medications, you know, the studies looking at gabapentin, almost all of them have patients with normal renal function. So those patients weren't included in the studies. Okay, first case, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's try let's try this first case first. Um, uh, Zena, she's a 48 year old female. She has a history of alcohol use disorder. Her last drink was this morning, so she does not have any withdrawal right now, and comes in to get medical clearance so she can go to sober living, the detox center, or sobering center, um, whatever is in your community. Um, she's had. Uh, attempts at stopping drinking before, but then return to drinking again after just like stopping on her own. So cold turkey, as it were. Cold turkey, yeah. So um, I guess, what are you guys thinking you would do for this patient? And is there any other information that you'd like to know potentially before we started this patient on any medications? I think we're doing chat or we can... Yeah, you can toss your thoughts in the chat. So what would you do for this patient? Let's assume that her medical clearance otherwise looks fine. You're going to let her go to this, help her go to the sober living community. What might you prescribe for her? Does no, she, she, she looks great. No chronic medical issues. She's not jaundiced, nothing. You end up saying she looks young and healthy otherwise. Great. What has worked before? History of withdrawal symptoms. So let's say, yeah, she's had withdrawal before. She's not doing it right now, but she's definitely like, never had seizures, but she's gotten shaky and sweaty and vomited and stuff in the past. See some medication suggestions, naltrexone with gabapentin. No Hopefully. opioid use, not for her. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so lots of really good stuff here, right? So we wanna know, does this patient use opioids? So can we use our, our, our naltrexone medication? What has worked before? Are they high risk for seizures? Um, a lot of really good things to think about. And then one thing that we didn't say specifically, but someone asked was, have they had withdrawal before, right? We talked about that. Um, so gabapentin is most effective for alcohol use disorder in patients that have had prior withdrawal syndrome histories. And so like that connection right there is something we don't always think about. We think like withdrawal equals AUD, but um, like the patients with AUD who have a history of withdrawal, that's when gabapentin is gonna work the best. So we've talked about a lot of these contraindications too. 
make sure they don't have decompensated cirrhosis. So I like this last answer, gabapentin and naltrexone. And that's what I'm telling my colleagues to do. That's what I teach the residents to do. Um, assuming there's no contraindications, a patient with AUD, history of withdrawal, not in withdrawal now, um, I would recommend starting both naltrexone and gabapentin um, and linking them to care at your local low barrier or bridge clinic, whatever there is available for you guys. Another question that came up that would be relevant in this moment, because it's not a wrong answer, since she's only ever had mild or moderate withdrawal, gabapentin is a great choice, but let's say you wanted to use Librium. What's your style, Eric, for somebody that you're going to send home with Librium, as, or sorry, with Florida as a poxide? Again, if we say brand um, it's only habit, not um, for <laughs> but what would your, what would your um, pattern be? I think uh, I lost you a little bit, but I, the question was Librium, right? When do we use Librium versus Gabapentin um, or, or Lorazepam or whatever? Um, so I, I talked, you know, you got to get a good history and talk to patients what's worked for them before. Like I said, like some patients, like they're like, I don't like Gabapentin. It makes me feel dizzy and weird. And I don't like it. And I still want them to have a really good chance to detox, uh, you know, like drink less. And so in those patients, I'll use Benzo. So it's not a, a, like a, a red line for me that you could say like, we're only doing gabapentin. Like every patient's different. Every scenario is a little bit different. My first starting point is gabapentin because we can use it to treat AUD as well. And I think it's helpful to frame withdrawal in the setting of alcohol use disorder. And with this medication, that is a useful thing to do. Um, but every, every patient's different. So if someone says, you know, I do really well with chlordazepoxide or I don't tolerate gabapentin, fine, no problem, let's give you a shot here and, and we'll see how it goes. And then I would then say, what am I gonna use for AUD and really make sure that I explore if it's not naltrexone, something else. Yeah, and as far as somebody had asked about a dosing or a taper regimen, similar to when we talk about um, uh, opioid use disorder and we say like patients know what withdrawal feels like and they can successfully induce themselves with um, buprenorphine. The same is sort of true of alcohol. Like patients who've been in withdrawal before, they know what that's like. So if you give them, you know, uh, chlordazepoxide, 10 milligram tablets, or if they've had more severe withdrawal, 25 milligram tablets, and you tell them, you know, take it four times daily as needed for withdrawal symptoms and taper down, you know, and give them some guidelines on what that means, they can do it. They're actually pretty good at doing it because they know their own body. So the patient can guide that, um, which is really nice. Okay, let's talk about our next case, which is Javier. And then we're gonna change it up a little bit. So he's really similar to Cena, but this time it's been a day and a half since his last drink. And he's the same thing, no other uh, substance use, but he is shaky and sweaty and vomiting. What would you do for Javier while he's here with you in the ER? I like that. Um, Jill, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit if you want to say in the comments. Ooh, and Susan, why are you guys picking phenobarbital? What's the reason? It's a good one. Yeah, and they're going into treatment. It's a person who wants to go into treatment. So you know that for the next few days at least, especially if you've got a great substance use navigator and they're going to help them get a place to go, that it's very safe for them to have been given phenobarbital and then go into a, an active recovery setting. That's a really, really nice transition. Okay, let's say we use phenobarbital, we do 260, maybe they need one more dose, so they get another 130. This is all IV, by the way. That's one of the things about phenobarbital. It's a little bit frustrating, but let's say you did it, you hydrated them, and now what's your plan for discharge? Other than connecting them to the sober living they'd like to go to. Great, anything else? So good option, naltrexone, gabapentin. And so one of the questions earlier, so sorry, you can, you can give phenobarbital IM, that is true. The bioavailability is different. So technically the dosing regimens for treating withdrawal are all based on IV dosing. It's less reliable in the intramuscular setting and it takes longer to take full effect. So if you're trying to titrate it in the ER, technically IV is the better dosing regimen. You can do a, a one-time dose pretty safely, I am, but if you're gonna try to repeat doses, we ought to be doing that IV. Um, so yes, naltrexone, one of the questions earlier was how soon can you start someone on naltrexone? And so I think this is a good example, pretty soon. They're not withdrawing anymore, they feel better, do it, start it now. Same with gabapentin. Any other meds? This is on the like life pro tip slide earlier. 
Anything else? Any other things you would recommend that they take when they leave? Vitamins? Yeah, vitamins, there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Susan Bravo, awesome, yeah. Multivitamin um, and talking a little bit about nutrition. Awesome, great job. So if we were going to just kind of quickly recap what all this looks like, these slides will be available to you, but basically someone comes in and withdrawal, the CEWA score is what, um, uh, the CEWA score is what we use to look clinically at how bad somebody's withdrawal is right now. So that's on here. It stands for clinical uh, alcohol withdrawal scale. But let's say we're talking about somebody with only mild or moderate withdrawal. You treat them with gabapentin or lorazepam or phenobarbital. They're getting better. You're going to do an SBIRT, which we'll talk about in a second. And then sending them home with the offering of uh, naltrexone. The IM one is difficult to do from the ER specifically because of insurance coverage, but you can use the PO version. Um, getting that substance use navigator consult, talking about harm reduction, and then ideally following up promptly. If they're more on the severe, moderate to severe side or moderate not getting better, that's when um, you could be talking about discharging with um, gabapentin or also some benzos um, to help keep that withdrawal under control if you're really worried about the risks of severe withdrawal um, versus our first case seen where it was like low level withdrawal in the past. Someone who's had seizures or terrible withdrawals before, they might need that full benzodiazepine support. So you could use epoxide or lorazepam. Um, and then you can add those same things back in though. You can still offer the naltrexone. You should still do your son consult and talk about harm reduction. Um, and then, yeah, Eric thinks that Javier is getting admitted. I actually would not. If Javier responded really well to two doses of phenobarbital and he's not in withdrawal anymore, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. And that's a little bit of that is style, but we're actually going to talk about it uh, in just a couple of slides here about how you make that decision. So Eric, I'm going to hand it back to you to talk a little bit about SBIRT. Okay, great. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can sort of integrate this alcohol use disorder treatment into the ED setting. And there is, everyone knows the model S BERT. And uh, I also, I want to present this model that, you know, I didn't make up. I, I think Kate Hawk was the one who published this with um, Gail D'Onofrio, uh, but was uh, STIR. And that is screening, treatment, initiation, referral to care. This is like the CA bridge model, right? Like we're not just being like, I have identified a problem, here's a piece of paper. It's like, I have identified a problem and I'm treating it and I'm also connecting you to outpatient care. Um, so uh, we're gonna put together SBIRT with naltrexone here. Um, so this is our first experience with naltrexone for AUD and our algorithm. We just published this paper, which we're excited about. So it's, it's out there, there is support for using both PO and XR naltrexone for patients with AUD. Um, we carved, we use this, our protocols for getting, admit, if you're admitted, you're going home, like it doesn't matter, right? Like we wanna treat ED, no, treat AUD, there's no wrong door. Uh, we carved out for this manuscript, patients that were going home from the ED. So these are uh, patients that are well appearing, they're not getting admitted to the hospital. You know, many did go to our sobering center um, or local detox facility. But the idea is that we wanted clinicians to identify a patient with moderate to severe alcohol use disorder, talk to the patient, right? Perform a brief intervention. Um, and then talk to our team, offer medications for AUD. So, you know, contraindications are what we discussed before. And we presented to patients that, hey, there are two options for naltrexone. You could take a pill every day, or we can give you a shot right now. Um, and uh, we looked at how these patients did in follow up. Uh, follow up for alcohol use disorder isn't great to begin with. This is our algorithm. We had about a 15 to 20% follow up rate for these patients. There was a signal that patients with XR naltrexone followed up at higher rates. It was, this wasn't an RCT. This was not what we were designed to do. This is a pilot study. Um, so I think there's a lot of really future work that's going to be exciting about you know, injectable medications in the ED, treating AUD in general. So let's talk about SBIRT next. Um, perform the brief intervention. There we go. So screening brief intervention referral for treatment. This is something that I think you guys have probably all heard of, are all doing already. SBIRT has the largest evidence base in support of its use for patients with unhealthy alcohol use and alcohol use disorder. It's recommended by ASEP as like a core foundation for treating patients with substance use disorders. 
sometimes this feels daunting, I think, if we're talking to clinicians and say, hey, can you do a brief intervention? Do a, I don't know what that is, or I haven't done for a while. Um, but, but really this is like, in my mind, a brief talk with the patient about their alcohol use. Like, I think we're already doing this a lot, but we're actually sort of like addressing the problem more formally. So what do we do? We ask patients, can we talk about your alcohol use? We review how much they're drinking. Is that too much uh, above higher than recommendations? We link that episode in the ED with alcohol use. And then we talk about change. So we talk to patients about like, how ready are you for change? Um, you know, what can we do to help you? Let's negotiate a plan going forward and link you to a community clinic. So I don't think this should feel like a big deal because I think that a lot of us do this already. And now we can just call it, you know, expert evidence-based like, standard practice, right? Like this is what a lot of us are doing already. So when we think about, let's go to the next slide here, um, setting goals for patients, everyone's gonna be different, right? So it's important that when we're talking to patients, we wanna do this in a compassionate and not in judgmental way. Um, again, this is just like being a good clinician, being a compassionate person, engaging with patients about their alcohol use. A lot of patients are not going to endorse abstinence as a goal. A lot of patients want to drink less. A lot of patients want to drink socially with their family and friends, and that's okay. We want to help them support along the way. Some patients might not be interested in stopping drinking, and we want to help them drink safer. So when we talk to patients, we want to elicit goals non-judgmentally in such a way that we can offer tools to them no matter what their goals are for alcohol. So when we talk about this, we're really talking about harm reduction. Uh, when we when we talk about harm reduction, um, can we go to the next slide here. Thanks. Uh, when we talk about harm reduction. Uh, we always think of like injection drug use, but we don't think about it as often for alcohol. And there's a lot of literature about this. Um, a lot comes from the University of Washington, but th it, there's a lot out there and a lot we can talk to patients about. These are just some of the things that I talk to patients about because you know we know why patients die from alcohol. They die from exposure, overdose, mixing other drugs, uh, trauma, and chronic disease. Like those are the main things that they're dying from. Um, so uh, when we're talking to patients about what they're drinking, like drink beer instead of hard alcohol. Remember to eat when you're drinking. You know, alternate beer with non-alcoholic beverages. Um, careful not to drink other drink while you're using other drugs. And another thing like is to count your drinks. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there. And I, and I think that my main things that I talk to patients about most of the time are eating. We talked about vitamins, but eating is probably more important than vitamins, but right, we talk about people about eating um, and then actually counting their drinks. And then Rebecca asks, what is a drink spacer? <laughs> so uh, that would just be like alternating uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. Spacing them out, right, yeah. Uh, so is there an evidence base for this? Yes, for sure. Um, there's a ton out there. Harm reduction works. Um, I, th this is just like a brief plug for this study that I love from Susan Collins at University of Washington. They did a randomized controlled trial of a harm reduction framework for treating alcohol use. They did it. It's, it's, a, it's a cool study. They did a bunch of stuff, but the, the basics of it are that take the main takeaway for me is that harm reduction counseling works for alcohol and it works best when used when alongside extended recent naltrexone. So really kind of, I think, so provide support for what we're talking about here. This study was primarily among homeless patients in Seattle, but I think there's a lot of um, applicability to the patients that we're seeing in the ED as well. And so this brings us to an item that uh, I was not ignoring all the questions in the chat about Javier's disposition, okay? I was deferring them for this moment, um, which is really interesting. So dispo, for those who aren't uh, an ED clinician, it's our word, it means disposition. Don't ask me where these medical words come from, but it basically means um, what is, where is the patient gonna go? Are they gonna get admitted to the hospital or are they leaving the hospital? And if they're leaving the hospital, to where? To sober living, to detox, to a boarding care, to like, what is, what is that? To their house, to, to a whatever, um, a psychiatric facility, et cetera. That's their dispo. And so when we use that word, that's what we're talking about. And so there are, there's not um, a single best answer 
in most of these cases. I will tell you that if the patient's really sick, obviously they should be admitted to the hospital. I mean, like there, there's some slam dunk admissions and the patient like came in, never was in withdrawal and just wanted clearance. Maybe that's a really obvious discharge patient. But in the middle, there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of things to think about. And so these are some of the lists that we came up with of like options that you have. So you have a detox facility versus a sober living facility versus staying inpatient versus going to an actual inpatient facility um, versus going to a rehab. People use that word kind of loosely a lot. Um, and then some of the challenges that, that get faced in all these scenarios. What's the insurance coverage? So many of these places require um, like payment up front, which can be really challenging and a barrier for a patient. Do they have to get a pre-authorization, which we really don't do from the ER, it's so hard. Um, and then the cost, the availability of a bed, especially during COVID, it was like so hard to get spaces for people to go to. And then what's the patient's risk level? So from a medical perspective, um, this is what I wanted to bring up about Javier, is that, you know, some people say like, I would have admitted that guy. I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have, maybe you would have. Is Am I right? Are you wrong? No, it's just that we would have had a little bit of a different style. And probably the reality is that we would have to actually sit and talk to Javier for us to figure out what the right thing for him was going to be, because there isn't a right or wrong answer. We pinned him for discharge on purpose, just to reinforce the discharge list of medications, <laughs> take home point, but it wasn't a wrong answer to say that he maybe was a good admission to the hospital. That, that would have been a completely reasonable thing to do. But what we'd love to hear from some of our substance use now navigators who are on because you honestly all of you do this so much more often than Eric or I do we rely on you is how do you decide when a patient wants to leave so don't worry about the inpatient that's the doctor's choice but if they're going to leave the hospital how do you help them decide where they're going to go what are some of the things that you ask them or are some considerations that you have found in your community for how they pick what that destination is you can put it in the chat if you want Insurance, yeah, I hate that that's one of them, but it's really true. Mm -hmm. Support system at home, really good point, Mandy, right? Somebody who's going back home to their own little apartment, like, ooh, maybe not as successful as like, they're here with their significant other or their parents or whatever. Yeah, Abby's saying insurance also involved their support system. Main thing is insurance, unfortunately. Their motivation, very fair. That's why the expert thing is so important. Like, where is this patient at right now? What are they really, and, and that might change every day. Yeah, stage of change, similar thing, the five A's, right? All kind of the same mechanism as expert insurance. Yeah, a lot of people are saying insurance. This is one of the most unfortunate things about the reality of practicing healthcare is that we do have to think about that sometimes. And the best option that you want is unavailable because of that. Yeah, sad face, Carrie. I agree. That's how I feel about it. What about risk level? What do we think makes a patient? high risk. What makes you think we really ought to find an inpatient bed or, or keep this patient here in the hospital because of that? Great. So they've got a history of delirium tremens, severe withdrawal, seizures. Those people probably, right, like even if you use phenobarbital, they may or may not need a little bit more observation and support on the inpatient setting. Ooh, mobility and comorbid issues. Good point, Rebecca. So somebody with like cirrhosis and they are in a wheelchair, like it's probably not the best person to go talk into a sober living community. Absolutely. Um, can they like get around their environment? Do they have other other drug use? Great point. It's not as, as clean cut. And we're about to talk about that. Frequent flyers. Yeah, they've proven to you that sending them home isn't really working, right? This is their third visit this month. Maybe it's time for them to stay here. And get a little bit more support. I like to say friendly faces. Yeah, <laughs> friendly faces. I love that. Yeah. Oh, can they even make a follow up appointment if they're in an outpatient sort of setting? That's a great point, Troy. And then I know our substance use navigators are getting excellent at this, but being able to navigate like different insurances actually provide transportation um, to people's appointments and stuff. So all of that is helpful to think about. But so you'll notice that what makes somebody high risk isn't just their medical comorbidities. And so I think. Um, advocating for the sons towards the doctors is that our doctors are great at knowing when someone's medically high risk and we often rely on you to come to us with that like hey actually this person's not a great candidate for outpatient here's why this is their 18th visit this year this is their like that kind of stuff is really helpful to think about so now we're going to get to everyone's most the part that you've all actually been so excitedly waiting for and we're going to mix the things you know about other drug use and add in alcohol Eric, you want to talk about Padma? Yeah, let's talk about Padma. So um, 
I'm just looking at the time. Okay, so this is a 54 year old female. She has a history of alcohol use disorder and she also uses heroin every day. Um, and the last use of any substance was two days ago. So she comes to the ED, she is sweaty, she's anxious, she's vomiting. Um, she does not look fantastic. She looks um, quite uncomfortable. And so we're gonna do a poll here that I, I think we'll have a few different questions of uh, what is going on with this patient? Uh, what would you do first? And how would you treat their alcohol use and opioid use disorder together? So this is a complicated patient and I'm gonna- uh, do, I, do I have to stop sharing for you guys to be able to put the poll up? Oh, it says hosts and panelists can't vote. So we, can't, we don't get to vote. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but I will say that uh, for some of these, there might not be a right answer. This is a complicated patient scenario that I do think the reality is we see fairly frequently. Um, so I'm curious what everybody thinks we should be doing here. Uh, not a candidate for naltrexone. I would agree with that. <laughs> I think that we get nervous a little bit about treating patients with buprenorphine and with uh, benzos or, or phenobarbital. Can we do this safely together? All right, so let's, uh, why don't we see what everyone said, if we can. Yeah, let me know if I have to set Okay. Up. Okay, great. So it looks like most say opioid withdrawal. No one said COVID. That was the answer, just kidding. Um, <laughs> both of those, yeah. And what would you do first, bup, Advan, and phenobar, both? How would you treat their co-occurring use disorders, bup and gabapentin? Yeah, so these are complicated patient scenarios. I'm not gonna say that there's necessarily a, a right answer for any of these. Um, we we're trying to present a case to someone who has opioid and alcohol withdrawal, so we can discuss that a little bit. Um, and how, what is, is there some evidence? Is there some experience using both at the same time? So I'm gonna go to the next slide here. So we, we looked at this, we, we said like, wait, this is something that comes up a lot. Like, hey, can you treat opioid withdrawal and alcohol withdrawal at the same time? And we just went through a bunch of charts and found a case series of patients who all got quite a bit of phenobarb or lorazepam and quite a bit of buprenorphine, either sublingual or IV. Um, and we wanted to see like, were there any really significant adverse events? My takeaway from this case series is, is that these patients are sick, right? Like if a, a person is in withdrawal from opioids and alcohol, there could be any number of reasons why they stopped using, you see two ICU admissions here. But the other takeaway that is important is that zero of these patients had any complications from the medications. So patients went to the ICU because they had like severe pneumonia or GI bleeds or pancreatitis. And these patients got up to 32 milligrams and 1040 of phenobarb. I mean, you know, this is something that you can do carefully. Um, and these are high risk patients who are going to go ahead and like many of them are going to be admitted. There's something that we should do. We should not shy away from treating co-occurring opioid and alcohol use disorder, alcohol withdrawal, especially in the ED where we have like, you know, we have a lot of resources available to us too. And so in case you couldn't see um, everything on the screen, so the question we had asked about the pad in the case was, what does she have? Just to try to point out, same with opioid withdrawal, that not all withdrawal is just plain withdrawal. It can be a mixed withdrawal. It could be COVID and withdrawal. It could be just COVID. It could be flu. It could be sepsis, right? So just making sure we don't anchor on those things and keeping withdrawal within our our thought process. And then what do you do first? But there's not a perfect right answer. You could try buprenorphine and wait and see. You could try a benzodiazepine, wait and see. You could try a little bit of both, wait and see. And it's not, none of, none of this is a science. This is the art of, of medicine coming into play here, doing your best by trying to assess which risk the patient has the most. One little trick for alcohol withdrawal, remember, is to look for the neurologic stuff. So tongue fasciculations, the like super fast flappy tongue, that's not opioid withdrawal. So it doesn't mean they don't have opioid withdrawal, but that helps you say, well, I know alcohol is a part of this. So I'm going to start by treating that and see where we're at. Very reasonable. So look for those neurologic symptoms and the patient's history, right? Have you ever had this before? Um, and then treating yeah. their alcohol and opioid use disorder, we had a bunch of options. The one we like, the drive home point is please no naltrexone because this person uses opioids. And it is okay to do buprenorphine and gabapentin together. Those are the take-home points on that one. Okay. 
Um, Kay Meyer, you're asking a lot of good questions about opioids. We have a ton of great resources for this kind of stuff on the California Bridge website. I'll leave it to one of our hosts to put the cabridge.org slash resources link there for you. We've got tons of stuff you can see to answer those questions. All right, James is a 46 year old male. He's got a history of alcohol use disorder and methamphetamine use. The last time he used anything was two days ago. And now he's in the ER and he's sweaty and agitated and paranoid. Like has this weird feeling that someone's trying to get him and he's just saying to you, I need help. So I don't know if we can put up the polling questions. I couldn't see them last time. So I don't know when they're actually up. But the first question is, what would you do first? Ativan, which is lorazepam, buprenorphine, both, maybe try some olanzapine, common brand name Zyprexa. And then let's say that we gave benzo. So if you don't, if you can't see the poll or you're not sure how to do it, you can also toss your thoughts in the comments. So lorazepam, a benzo, buprenorphine, both or Zyprexa, olanzapine, which is an antipsychotic medicine that we often use for people who are in methamphetamine-induced psychosis. And then let's say that you give the benzodiazepine, okay? And now they're better. They feel great. They're like calm and they want help going to a detox facility. How would you treat their stimulant and alcohol use disorder with your discharge plan? Options include naltrexone, Narcan challenge, and then naltrexone. Ooh, we're getting fancy. Mirtazapine, buprenorphine, Ativan, Zyprexa, everything or some combination of these medications. Anybody feel brave enough to talk about their thoughts in the comments? This is a tough one. All right. Um, can you see the answers, Eric? If you can, you can recap them. I can't see them. Okay, there we go. Ativan, first line for most people. It's a, it's a safe option, honestly. It treats nice. everything. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> so I hope I'm not frozen, but one. You're good, Eric. I can see you now. I was just going to make a comment about my county hospital. Um, yeah, I, I, I did freeze for a second, but um, I do think that w I don't routinely challenge patients who only drink. But if a patient uses stimulants, I think it's a reasonable thing to do because like they pointed out, there's a lot of contamination in the methamphetamine supply. Um, so we do want to be more careful with patients who are using meth and starting naltrexone. That said, uh, naltrexone is also a medication that can be used for stimulant use disorders alongside bupropion it's in a recent study. And so I think it's a really good choice. We just wanna be a little thoughtful about initiating naltrexone. Hopefully that came through. It did, it did. And um, we're getting some good questions in here about other treatments for our other favorite conversation, which is stimulant use disorder. <laughs> um, but so Rebecca, a really Zyprexa, which is the brand name for olanzapine, is a really good medicine to help with methamphetamine induced psychosis. And it's got a pretty good tolerance. So usually you can put patients on about five milligrams twice daily for a handful of days. And then that's helpful. I think a really nice take home in this case is that with both alcohol use issues and methamphetamine use or stimulant use, benzodiazepines are helpful and indicated. So it's a pretty good first choice is to try um, a lower moderate level benzodiazepine like two milligrams of lorazepam, super reasonable. And then just kind of watch. Um, don't forget the beauty of watchful waiting. Try one thing and give it two hours, <laughs> see what happened, right? And then try something else. Um, and just don't forget that you, um, you have access to those uh, substance use hotlines. If you've ever got a patient that's complicated and you're not sure what to do, you can always call those provider warm lines that we always talk about. Um, Dave brought up a really interesting question about uh, confirmatory drug testing. 
So I do want to be very clear that we've got a pretty strong stance that we should never mandate or need drug testing in the ER. Like, believe it or not, most patients who tell you what drugs they use, they're telling the truth. <laughs> so we can believe them when they said they did meth. But when you've got a mixed picture or someone who maybe is showing signs of like an opioid issue, but they think that they use meth, they may not know that their meth's been laced with fentanyl. So sometimes there's definitely a good use of a drug screening um, to help us figure out what was in there. But it shouldn't be being used in a way to like prove someone was using something, which sometimes we hear people say. So just be careful about the framing of it. But for sure, what Dave said is true, that to try to figure out your mixed pictures, it can be really helpful. Um, I will stay, I know we're just about out of time here. I wanna show you this slide, which is that we have the alcohol use, again, disorder protocol from Bridge and a bunch of stuff about opioids and all kinds of good things on our website. So feel free to go there for more information. Here's how you can follow along and join us. Um, I want to announce the next Changemaker talk, which if you haven't registered yet, please do. Um, Reb and Sharon both are just like absolutely phenomenal. And they're going to talk about youth um, and medication for addiction treatment for youth um, coming up here in November. Um, and then here are our emails. I am free to linger if we have some more questions, but I wanted to blow through those so people who have to leave can go. And then if anyone wants to post any other questions that we didn't get to, thank you all for being here. Have a great day, but let us know. Um, somebody had asked about, um, is it safe to start the gabapentin at the 600 milligrams three times a day dosing when we're so used to being told you have to taper it? Eric, do you want to address that? Yeah, yeah. For for patient, you, you, even those studies with patients who are in withdrawal when they compared to Ativan, there wasn't a ramp up. There was actually a taper down um, for, for in those studies. So so yes, if you're using it for withdrawal, you don't have to. And I, and I briefly mentioned it probably got stuck in there, but um, in LA County, um, Brian Hurley and their their like county county um, addiction treatment program actually had a gamba, gabapentin monotherapy protocol that they use, especially during COVID. And the first dose was 1,200 milligrams. So we've done that a few times here too. And so it, patients who have withdrawal can tolerate those higher doses initially, and we just keep going. I don't have fentanyl in my testing in my ED. How great would that be? Yeah, we're actually getting in ours because interestingly. We got like a bunch of different kind of tests for COVID, you know, and it turns out one of those machines is the modality you need to be able to run opioid differentiating drug screening. And since we're not running as many COVID tests now, they're like, what do we do with this machine? And I was like, I will take the opioid test. <laughs> oh so we're doing it. Yeah. So check with your lab and see if they've got, you know, the machine that will do it. It's worth asking. All right, other questions. I know this is a complicated, we blew through a lot. So I'm just getting back up to make sure I didn't miss anything else. Um, is it okay to give olanzapine and mirtazapine at the same time? I think Eric answered that. Yes, yes it is, it is okay. Yeah, mirtazapine I think can be helpful for patients that have some I mean, like they can have like frank psychosis, but um, you know, it does help with depress depression with psychotic features. And so it's certainly reasonable to both at the same time if you, if you needed to. We don't usually continue patients on olanzapine um, routinely. I think we use it more acutely, but yeah, good question. And then they ask uh, if they continue drinking, what happens if they keep drinking on naltrexone? I think a lot of patients think they're gonna get sick, right? But they don't. Um, they just drink less, right? It's just like that that dopamine surge from alcohol is dampened, you know? And so you just, the idea is that you still do drink and you do drink less. And someone mentioned Sinclair method, which you don't need to get into, but that's like part of the idea there as well. Yeah, some of the other medicines for alcohol use disorder straight up make you sick. If you drink, that's not the way that naltrexone works, which is why we like it. We don't want to force people to get sick. Mm -hmm. Are the protocols different in chronic pain patients um, that need to get off of opioids but still have pain? Uh, that's a, a complex question, Kay. I think um, the side note that I'll offer here is that buprenorphine, the medicine we often talk about for opioid treatment, right, can be very useful in chronic pain treatment as well. And so there is definitely room for treating that with buprenorphine without not being able to do these other things. Like you can still use gabapentin in those cases if somebody's got a mixed picture. 
yeah, Vivitrol is extended release naltrexone. That's what that brand name is. Uh, patients almost always ask for brand name medicines. They'll say Vivitrol, Suboxone, Ativan. That's why we use them, I think, is just common vernacular. Um, and again, the limitation there in the ER has to do with preauthorization and cost. And that's why some ERs don't even carry the injection form of naltrexone, and it just has to do with payments and coverage. It's not that it's not safe, it's safe. All right, any last minute burning questions? And you can always reach us. I'll toss um, my email again into the um, into the chat here in case you just wanna snag it. You're welcome to reach out to us anytime. Um, everyone in the world has Elizabeth Keating's email address. You can always email her and she can connect you to us. <laughs> it does feel that way sometimes, just in case that's not true. I will also put my email in the chat and i um, always happy to connect anyone with clinical questions to um, usually just the next person I talk to or the person <laughs> who's right to answer them. Uh, um, I am glad somebody asked this really quickly about banana bags. Don't use banana bags. It's a thousand dollar version of an oral vitamin. You just don't need that. We don't do that anymore. It's really, really expensive and it's not necessary. So you can just do um, an I, you can do an IV single dose of thiamine and an IV single dose of folic acid for people who are really sick and in the hospital. And it costs like $25. Um, a banana bag, the pharmacy has to mix and it gets put in this little thingy and it can't have UV light and blah, 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 blah. And it's like super expensive and the patient gets a bill for that. So don't use the banana bag. But what you're trying to do is just get the vitamins. If they're not puking, do the pills. Just as good as the IV. If they are puking, just do a single IV, folic acid and thiamine and you've got yourself covered. And Nash, thanks for saying you could listen to these scenarios all day. Uh, we have people who can talk about them all day. So we're working on finding ways to get them to you more often and more organized. So thanks. Awesome. All right. I Thanks, hope everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And to Alicia and Eric, thank you so much for bringing this important topic to everybody. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, oh, we love you too, Jill. Bye.